Welcome to Rondout Valley United Methodist Church's remote worship for Sunday, April 14th, 2024. This is the second Sunday of the month, and that means that it is our second Sunday supper in Stone Ridge, and that will be at 2 o'clock today. As always, it is free and open to all. Uh, come and uh, bring a friend or neighbor. Our call to worship this morning. In the midst of our sorrow and grief, Christ comes to ease our pain. In the midst of our doubts and fears, Christ comes to bring us hope. In the midst of our sickness unto death, Christ brings us life. Our opening prayer, which is from Ministry Matters. Gracious God, you give us your greatest gift, your son, Jesus Christ. As we still don't understand what is going on, you call us to be people of courage and hope, and yet we run and hide, doubting and fearing. You challenge us to proclaim our faith, but we huddle in darkness, whispering our words of discouragement. Shake us up, Lord. Forgive us. We seem to need prodding over and over again. Help us to see the presence of Jesus in our lives and remind us of all that he taught us to help us to live as disciples serving you by serving others change us remold us make us truly the disciples you have called us to be amen <laughs>
Our first reading this morning is from Acts, Acts chapter 3, verses 12 to 19. Shortly after Pentecost in Jerusalem, Peter testifies to the power of faith in the name of Jesus after the healing of a man who had been lame his whole life. When Peter saw it, he addressed the people, You Israelites, why do you wonder at this? Or why do you stare at us as though by our own power or piety we had made him walk? The God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, the God of our ancestors, has glorified his servant Jesus, whom you handed over and rejected in the presence of Pilate, though he had decided to release him. But you rejected the Holy and Righteous One and asked to have a murderer given to you. And you killed the author of life, whom God raised from the dead. To this we are witness. And by faith in his name, his name itself, has made this man strong, whom you see and know. And the faith that is through Jesus has given him this perfect health in the presence of all of you. And now, friends, I know that you acted in ignorance, as did also your rulers. In this way, God fulfilled what he had foretold through all the prophets, that his Messiah would suffer. Repent, therefore, and turn to God, so that your sins may be wiped out. Our New Testament reading is from 1 John chapter 3, verses 1 to 7. See what love the Father has given us, that we should be called children of God, and that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Beloved, we are God's children now. What we will be has not yet been revealed. What we do know is this. When he is revealed, we will be like him, for we will see him as he is. And all who have this hope in him purify themselves, just as he is pure. Everyone who commits sin is guilty of lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. You know that he was revealed to take away sins, and in him there is no sin. No one who abides in him sins. No one who sins has either seen him or known him. Little children, let no one deceive you. Everyone who does what is right is righteous, just as he is righteous. Today's Gospel reading picks up in the 36th verse of Luke chapter 24 and continues through verse 48. Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. They were startled and terrified and thought that they were seeing a ghost. He said to them, Why are you frightened and why do doubts arise in your hearts? Look at my hands and feet. See that it is I myself. Touch me and see, for a ghost does not have flesh and bones, as you see that I have. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. While in their joy they were disbelieving and still wondering, he said to them, Have you anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and ate in their presence. Then he said to them, these are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the Law of Moses, the Prophets, and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the Scriptures, and he said to them, Thus it is written that the Messiah is to suffer and to rise from the dead on the third day, and that repentance and forgiveness of sins is to be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. Here we 
we are on the third Sunday of Easter, the church season that begins on Easter Sunday and lasts until Pentecost on the 50th day. The brief gospel reading you just heard comes from almost the very end of Luke. There are only five more verses in the rest of the gospel. Those five, plus some of what I just read, will reappear in the lectionary cycle on May 9th or 12th to remember Jesus' ascension, 40 days after Easter Day and 10 days before Pentecost. Got that? If you're feeling a bit confused, you are in good company. Jesus tells his first followers that you are witnesses of these things, or as the Greek puts it, humes este martores tuta. And these things are astonishingly comprehensive. They include but are not limited to everything that Jesus had said or done while he was still with them, everything written about him in the law, prophets, and writings of Hebrew scripture, his rising from the dead, and the imperative to proclaim repentance and forgiveness of sins in his name to all nations. Starting point, Jerusalem. Starting date, now. And now, as Luke relates it, is actually the first Easter day, evening. And I admit, it feels kind of weird to me after I've just reminded us that Easter is a season and we're now on the third Sunday of it to say that as far as the gospel reading goes, we're still on day one. And if you recall, on Easter Sunday, the gospel lesson was from the end of Mark. And then last week, it was from chapter 20 of John's Gospel, and today it's from Luke. Three accounts from three different witnesses' perspectives of what happened with Jesus on that third day after his crucifixion. So maybe that's a good way to spur us to bear witness to the resurrection. Present us with a variety of experiences of the first disciples recognizing that the more views of the events we hear, the more likely we are to find someone or something that speaks to us in our context. So what is the context of today's piece of Luke 24? It's the first astonishing Easter evening, just after two of Jesus' followers one unnamed and one named Cleopas, have hurried back to Jerusalem where the eleven remaining in the core group of disciples are already gathered. The two have just met with the resurrected Jesus on the road to Emmaus. They've eaten with him, and they've had the scriptures explained to him. The eleven greet the news of their amazing encounter with their own amazing news, the Lord has risen indeed, and he has appeared to Simon. And that's when the risen Lord Jesus comes, in person, in the flesh, to join them all. Now, after everything they've just witnessed, and the comparing of notes on their encounters with the risen Jesus, you'd think that everyone would be extremely receptive when Jesus shows up. But that's not exactly their response. Were told they were startled and terrified and thought that they were seeing a ghost. And a little later, yet for all their joy, they were still disbelieving and wondering. It's like Thomas again, almost. And besides patiently showing them his hands and feet, flesh and bones, do you remember what Jesus does? He asks for something to eat. And they give him a piece of broiled fish and he took it and ate it in their presence. And that, friends, is about the most Jesus-y thing Jesus could do. And I think that was probably just as important as all of the expounding scriptures in moving those first disciples from doubt and fear to bold public witness bold public witness, such as you heard from Peter in Acts chapter 3. Sharing food 
food with them doesn't just reinforce the message that Jesus is alive in the flesh. It reminds them, and us, of all the times Jesus shared food with them and with so many others, bringing the grace of God and the promise of new and forgiven life and food to the disciples, even as he was about to be betrayed, to tax collectors and sinners, despite the uh, criticism of those looking on, to hungry multitudes, hungry not only for food, but for compassion. Maybe they're also reminded how Jesus had a tendency to compare the kingdom of God to a great banquet with a lot of surprising invitees. And after the sharing of himself and the sharing of food, the icing on the cake is Jesus' declaration that you are witnesses of these things. You, plural. And not just those disciples long ago and far away, but everyone who follows Jesus today. Our job description is both really clear and really vague. The clear part, be a witness to Jesus the Christ and proclaim repentance and forgiveness of sins in his name to all nations. The vague part, how on earth are you supposed to do this? Two suggestions from the early church. Do it together in fellowship with one another. And do it while and by feeding others. Everyone has to eat. So there will never be a time that there won't be someone hungry somewhere. The basic human need for food compels us as, not only as Christians, but as citizens of the world to reach out to those facing famine and starvation, no matter how many or how far. You, you just do it. Do you remember the 1985 Live Aid concerts on different continents to raise funds to alleviate the Ethiopian famine? I think they raised something somewhere in the neighborhood of anywhere between $127 million to $140 million. And that's without the internet. And just this month, there has been the global shock at the killing of seven World Central Kitchen workers who were delivering food aid in Gaza. Because something in us recoils at those seven deaths especially, despite the thousands of others. Because how could anyone possibly attack people providing food to the hungry? Think, too, of our local food pantry, which is probably the longest established and most recognized ministry in the community done by all of the churches here over decades. One of a number of what are called fresh expressions of Christian faith these days is called simply Dinner Church. And I'd like to read a paragraph from a document from the, the Greater New Jersey Annual Conference. They, they address the question, what is a dinner church? It is a gathering of people of goodwill weekly, bi-weekly, or monthly, where all the most important things happen at the table. There is a meal, but the group does not meet first and then eat, or eat dinner and then have church. And you would not likely take the main worship activities into a room away from the eating area. It all happens simultaneously. Think of a good dinner party with a spiritual twist. And then just add art music, poetry, scripture, robust conversation, and prayerful moments which may embrace silence, simple liturgy, or a single person who says the prayer on behalf of the group. 
Today at 2 o'clock will be Rondout Valley's second Sunday supper. It's something we've continued to do for everyone and anyone for free. And it's always something of a leap of faith and loaves and fishes experience. We never know how many people will show up. But there's always enough food. If you wonder how that works, think for a moment about what Jesus might do. And you know, if you're doing what Jesus would do, you're doing something right. You, yes you, are a witness to Jesus. Not only to what he did long ago and far away, but how he still works in real lives today. I'll end with Jesus' words from the last chapter of John's Gospel, which the lectionary skips over this year, as the risen Lord charges Peter. Jesus says to Peter, Feed my lambs, tend my sheep, feed my sheep. Let us pray. All loving God, we bring our broken, unjust, and warring world to you today. We long to see your justice and peace on earth as it is in heaven. We long to see people flourishing wherever they may be. We long to see your righteousness cover our world. We pray for all those who are in positions of power. We pray for politicians whose decisions affect so many. Give them wisdom and courage in the issues they choose to tackle. Give them servant hearts, we pray, from local town boards to presidents, from those behind the scenes to those on our screens each day. May the well-being of all people be their goal. Lord, in your mercy, may justice and peace reign in our world. We pray for all those who hold economic power over others, from our smallest companies to the largest multinationals. May their dealings be fair to all. Fair wages, fair conditions, fair ways of making things and disposing of waste, fair to the environment. Lord, in your mercy, may justice and peace reign in our world. We pray for all of those who use physical and emotional power over others, from our own living rooms to the world arena. We pray especially for people who live in fear of violence in their own homes for children who experience abuse instead of love, for young people who live in fear of violence on the streets, for all for whom war or the threat of war is a constant. Lord, in your mercy, may justice and peace reign in our world. We pray for all of those who use religious power to shape and control people's lives. For those who, like the Pharisees, limit and bind people rather than freeing them. Those who act in their own power, blind to the healing love of Christ. Open their eyes to your spirit at work in the world. Lord, in your mercy, may justice and peace reign in our world. We thank you for all of those who use their knowledge and power for good, for those who are willing to stand up and speak truth to power, for those who risk their own lives to help others in distress, for those who quietly come alongside the broken and lost and abused. Guide us in the ways of justice and courage every step of our journey. May your vision and hope for the world infuse all that we do. Lord, in your mercy, may justice and peace reign in our world. These things we pray in the name of Jesus, 
and continue as he has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Jesus' name. Amen.